Hello, good morning. I think everybody's a little bit slow to get here. I'm sure there are more people on their way in. Maybe the traffic is a bit bad this morning. Um, but I did want to get started just because, um, as we saw from last week, Todd has quite a bit of content to deliver, and I'm sure today will be uh, much of the same, which is fortunate for us. Um, I'm not going to repeat too much more about Todd. As you know, he comes to us from Berkeley, uh, where he's been for quite some time. He's their senior early modernist. Maybe he can tell you what early modern means, since people get confused about that a bit. But um, I was just... Uh, trying to get Todd to tell me how to deal with Van Gogh in the same way that uh, one has to deal with any canonical artist. There are so many difficulties that arise, um, not least of which uh, is the problem of over-familiarity. And with Caravaggio, this is the thing that I'm telling him is so admirable about what he chooses to work on, because when you choose an artist who's so familiar, um, the density of literature that is piled up all around the artist makes it almost impossible to say anything that seems to be new, different, relevant, and yet to refresh that material and to revivify the object as it always is capable of doing at that level, the quality of the object in itself allows you to reinterpret it and reinterpret it and renew its relevance to you um, every time. So, you know, that that's sort of the phenomenon of a great work of art. Um, but then also there are those fissures, and I think that the fissures are the things that attract Todd the most, and, and me too, is just those instances when an artist is struggling, when an artist is making a transition, um, the idea of trying to reinvent a vocabulary from a distance, and in the case of Caravaggio, coming as a sort of surprise invader, um, as some of the greatest artists always uh, do, and Van Gogh is very similar in that regard. Um, but in any case, um, I'm going to give you Todd again for part two of his lectures on Caravaggio, which is the subject of his book. If you tried to buy it in the store, unfortunately, we sold out, um, which is a good thing. Um, but I wasn't able to get more copies in for him to do a book signing, but hopefully uh, we'll get more copies in the store for you to buy um, later on. Um, so without further ado, Todd. Thank you again, Ike. Um, could I have the lights, please? Or I like to call it the mood lighting. Um, and thank you for coming. And uh, it was a generous crowd last time. Um, and I want to set the ground for a discussion again. Um, is there the light? Oh, it's okay. It's okay. Um, yeah, sorry. Thank you. So let me just begin. Um, the this is where we left off last time. Um, the kind of surprise work, a problem work in the Contarelli Chapel. Um, and it's a way to get into a, a couple of different problems I'm going to address today. Um, one is we've already discussed the ways in which the work is surprising in regard to a particular kind of training. Um, an artist who had specialized in still life, half figures, had done uh, certain kinds of genre or low life painting. Um, and built up all those kinds of resources, but had never tackled the full-scale human nude in a significant narrative and a violent narrative. So this was the problem piece in terms of uh, the development of the work. So we're, in order to talk about that, we're going to talk about um, a kind of challenge, an ill-fit set of tools, and then certain kinds of resolutions or investigations of uh, the matter of constructing an, uh, an image. But a, constructing an image that is, in some sense, deconstructing the normative tools of a certain tradition in Italian art history. And that is the, what I would just, as a place marker, talk about chiaroscuro. So we're going to be talking about kind of these fundamental elephant in the room 
uh, terms like modeling, shadow, um, the gradation of tone, these kinds of um, structures or technologies that are just uh, everywhere in terms of global Western art history. Um, and it's important to think about that because it's always, you know, we just take for granted this kind of technology. And by taking granted, we would, what we don't recognize are the significant losses or sacrifices that took place in having a singular or unidirectional uh, set of assumptions about what a picture should look like. In other words, what, what gets cast off. Now, so an artist who we call an innovator is also investigating the latent properties or the lost properties, the potentials that were cast aside when the, the, as it were, the great machine of Italian tonal painting from Masaccio through Piero through Michelangelo and Raphael, that machine, as it were, and that's, I, I'm going to talk in more subtle terms about that machine, but that machine and directed a certain kind of anticipation or preoccupation with a, a very fixed set of values in terms of pictorial expression. So that's one part, not in the, my ambitious uh, attempt to, this is my, uh, this is kind of a bucket list um, set of, I'm always wanting to throw out my bucket list of just works I want to talk about or want you to see. Um, and so that, that, those sets of preoccupations are, I'm going to summarize uh, succinctly. And then I would like to move on to another investigation by Caravaggio, which um, is about, uh, we can use the catchphrase, materiality, uh, talking about the matter or the, the stuff of painting, you know, the stuff that we don't w have, we only drawing inferences from, from the screen about that. But, and when you encounter a work, um, you're always drawing inferences about the production and materials that took place, the processes that take place. But I want to push that a bit in terms of a couple of terms um, that are really important for understanding Caravaggio. And they're, they're anachronistic, they're pre-modern pre or early modern. Early modern is a kind of uh, catch-all word, uh, an inclusive term that doesn't have the baggage of Renaissance. So if you're wondering what early modern is. Um, so the, the, the two terms I, and I put on the list is the notion of uh, presentia, and the other is about impetus. And presentia is uh, a sense of the presence of a divine person, a saint, or a god, uh, inhabiting an object, whether it's a relic or a, or a contact relic, uh, the, the house that the Virgin lived in that was miraculously transported from Jerusalem to uh, Loreto. Uh, that house, it's a sacred shrine because it, it, it was a place that, in which the Virgin Mary inhabited and had the Annunciation. So this, the kind of sense of how an object in the world, a non-human object, can have a divine presence, how a profane object, uh, a stone, uh, the, with the stone that the Buddha st steps on and le leaves an impression of his footprint, that, that contains a sacred presence. So that's where the non-human and the human um, inter, uh, are getting a little confused. <laughs> and that confusion, which you know, we can write off as fetishism, as primitive, is, of course, you know, a living, a living tradition for, peop for people of religion. Um, but it's also a sense of what, what, um, what drives me in terms of the, the fact of painting. You know, painting as a material presence that, um, that has its own uh, pushback, its own, do, do I dare say, agency, do I dare say, um, a kind of affective relationship to me that has uh, that's a non-human 
social interaction. Um, so th that's one aspect of presentia is in this religious context. And the, in the more broader, um, long-term intellectual, let's say scientific notion of, uh, of understanding the world, um, the other term is empathis. Empathis, um, as a catch-all phrase, is about, again, the, the primacy of materials to have efficacy, even volition, and even desire. That the, the, you can explain the world and its transformations and its ups and downs by the ways that the elements, non-human events, behave in certain ways as we understand to be human. Um, and that again is an area that's part of an early modern culture, pre-modern, going back to Aristotle, um, which um, I think um, there's a residue, I always believe in these kinds of residues of dis disregard, disbanded, disregarded uh, materials. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna the, the, the talk will talk about that, and ultimately it's about the aff affective power of art based on that materiality. Not materiality as, you know, studying the cadmium content or the lead content, but materiality as, uh, again, engaging. A w another way of talking about uh, human emotion and narrative. Uh, so, in brief, the, or just try to get to the gist of this problem, the initial problem is the, this chapel, and the chapel is, as I, I'm rehearsing the argument, is the Contarelli Chapel, it's in San Luigi de Francese, it's halfway between the Piazza Navona and the, um, and the Pantheon in the French Quarter. Um, and uh, Cardinal de Monte, the uh, patron of Caravaggio, uh, enlisted him to complete this chapel for the 1600 year of the Jubilee. And it, you know, it fits, you know, fits with his program. You know, it, um, it satisfies all the criteria found in the Sepulchre de Maeus of a religious work emerging from a profane world, um, a confusion. Again, that's not legibility, not uh, narrative relevance, but rather dealing with actual ambiguity as the stuff of painting. Um, that narrative ambiguity, rather than clarity, um, offers the kind of violent juxtaposition of salvation and being not on the other side of that equation. Um, so, you know, and again, it's the it's the, the, the training that was entailed in doing something like the card sharps at Fort Worth, the um, multiple figures around a table. I can, you know, I can give you the laundry list of the, the elements, but the laundry list of elements uh, doesn't take us very far when we get to this juxtaposition, the two lateral paintings. And I've, uh, as I've explained, lateral paintings in an altar are the, is a place where the action occurs. That's where the um, instability of narrative can take place uh, as opposed to the orthodoxy of the center altar that you may not, we're, we're not, even, not even talking about the center altar right now. Um, and on the right side, and it's prominent, it's a prominent chapel on the left side of the church, um, within eye shot of the, of the center, um, if, you're, if you sit there, they have an extraordinary Oregon, there was a, um, this church was famous for its castrati, uh, a, whole, a whole crew of young boys who had um, very beautiful, strong voices. Um, so there was, a, it was a sense of that this painting would be set in the context of a very special church, and so it, um, and it's secured and stays in there. It's a successful painting, even though it had its growing pains. And the growing pains was about trying to resolve in some way. Resolve is, a, is, a, uh, is not quite the right term because um, resolve suggests that 
it's all been cleaned up and it's orderly and the narrative is clarified um, that there's a harmony and balance, et cetera, a resolution. It, there's a sustained irresolution in the work, I would say. And part of that sustained irresolution is about the complexity of the event. Um, and so we could, in some ways, we could break it down again in terms of what are the, what are the strategies that are brought to bear on the work by an artist working, imagining himself as a, um, having this direct engagement with objects in the world. So, let's take a look. Um, you know, this is a, this, this, you will see this detail over and over again because of the, the self-portrait of Caravaggio embedded in, in the picture in this part. And here we have, I have this detail of this area. And what we see is, again, is if, um, the detail is helpful because it suddenly brings us, it defamiliarizes that image to us. It allows us on close inspection to see how complex this area, these areas are. Um, now, part of that complexity is allow a great deal of ambiguity in terms of spatial relation in depth, projection, as well as um, the integrity of whole bodies as perceived. You know, when, you, when you break it down, if you say that is a figure and that is a figure, what you, actually, you, what you always have to do the exercise is, what do I actually see? And how have I shut down? How have I shut down the painting by saying there's a figure, right? Instead of saying there's a figure, I, I would I'd say here you have this slightly occluded three quarter, and this what the hell is this? You know this this kind of patch of paint here, which again um, we know that this figure here is in the foreground with respect to this figure, and then this one is is behind that figure. And yet, um, optically, this dark area pushes in, you know, it's like the uh, Hans Hoffmann, the push-pull, um, right? You know, you know the, the mantra, push-pull, push-pull. <laughs> so it's, um, it, optically, this pops, right? Or I once had a truly Renaissance professor, a really elegant man, who, when I said it pops, he said, no, it asserts itself. <laughs> yeah, studio jargon versus the Renaissance man. Uh, so anyway, so, the, so this, this, and then what's key here, and a little, this is the key here, is it's not only that contradiction, right? There's a certain sense of a purposeful contradiction where the light is not it's not clarifying the form, right? It's not, it's not orienting ourselves into where we, where we feel comfortable that there's a figure in relationship to another figure and that there's an ample space for them to move, that there's a ground plane. Um, no, there's no ground. I mean, there's, a, there's guys sitting around a tub um, with this amazing, there's a, it, again, it, it's lost, it's lost even in the, in the presence of the object, which is the ways that in this baptismal fount, you've got blood dripping into that. In other words, that kind of intimate, again, this disorientation between sustained engagement with the surface and then the kind of the march of the historia, the march of having to explain an entire narrative. So it, it again, like a, all great art, it kind of invites these kinds of contradictory impulses of reading, et cetera. But and this is not, you know, so the, the art historians used to say, you know, he solved he saw it, he resolved it. But this is the, this, these are points of irresolution where what is that sword in relationship to this hand? What is that hand doing, and where does it belong? Where does, you know, where do these guys orient themselves? Um, these certain sets of contradictions. Now, 
part of that is like this, um, which is the kind of one is the overlapping or occlusion of form is a way to establish um, difference in the world, right? That we know an apple versus a pear versus a grape by the differential reflection of light or the differential texture. In other words, it's a, it's a panoply of objects. It's a, it's a stress on surface as opposed to volume. Um, it's a stress on differentiation and uh, the heterogeneity of the world as opposed to the homogene homogeneity of the world. Um, it's also, as we've said here, is there's a, you know, it, there's such a sense of interlocking intimacy of objects. So, so part of it is the strain of what we know to be a violent action, and at the same time, simultaneous, is the ultimate kind of frisson, the, the, um, the as I say, intimacy or con contact of things and materials and peoples, that as generative of, of a certain kind of narrative. And so that's the, that's the, the thinking of the, of the still life painter. So even in the, in the larger, more, most ambitious painting, we've got these kinds of issues. Um, and this is also to admit that he's working damn hard on this figure. In other words, this is a real accomplishment. Um, it's not to deny that he really did his homework in terms of, again, someone who, as, we've, as I want to underscore, um, is not trained in, does not have this deep muscle memory of drawing that is this tradition. Or one of the, the, the major machine of the tradition is, is, is drawing. Um, so the, these other kinds of genres um, afforded to uh, various artists um, are based on different kinds of strategies. And someone like Artemisia Gentileschi uh, is precisely that kind of artist who doesn't have access to the live male nude because she's a woman. She's trained by her father to uh, focus on the, the handling of fabric, and that becomes the basis for her investigation of uh, Judith and Hall of Fairness and Cleopatra and uh, a host of representations of death and violent interaction in a historical portrait. So, so this, this, this trying this transposition of skills is an important one but it but it's still the thing that always got the thing that kind of disquieted me and became again it's uh, it's always in these marginal figures that of a painting that um, that we want to look to um, you know in the in the tr tr tradition these are tremo figures you know they're 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 figures that um, in the like late Renaissance, that's where the a little bit of the uh, exercise and demonstration of one's facility with the with the nude figure could take place. Uh, they're very they're you know they're the they're the they're the sidekicks right or the they're the supporting uh, supporting actors right uh, the extras and the, and the extras can. You know the peas and carrots, peas and carrots. They are allowed a certain kind of uh, autonomy. Then that autonomy allows again a certain amount of um, improvisation, investigation, etc., and in showing off. You know, uh, but these aren't. What's odd about these figures is they're not show-off figures. They're not him. It's not like. Um, He's, 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 his memory, or the memory he wants us to think of in some ways is the Michelangelo Ignudi, the, the representation of male nude figures on the ceiling in the Sistine Chapel, that kind of thing. That's the, that, that would be the uh, cultural predisposition to think in those terms. But 
the results, you know, um, you know, is this kind of, it's awkward, right? And that awkwardness is, seems to be so purposeful. It's not just he had a bad day or he didn't, it's an unresolved um, or, you know, the, believe me, painting, painters can have off days. I, I'll admit that. And some, you know, it's a hit or miss thing. But here is, there's a, the stakes are really high in this painting. And yet, you know, when I looked at this, I saw you know, like the yoke around an ox. Um, the um, this, uh, discoordination of the figure, this, this um, inordinate attention to parts that I shouldn't be looking at. And that was, that was part of the, um, the, the way I'm trying to think about how um, he, he's, 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 this investigation is taking place. Now the real, the real kicker was always, uh, this is the, on the other side, and this is a very prominent part of the canvas. We're on a lateral wall. It's, it's, it's almost, it almost uh, upstages the central drama of the executioner with the saint uh, the angel with holding down the martyr, uh, the palm of martyrdom, um, and these these acolytes or baptismal uh, these guys up for to be baptized on the edges. Um, again, my problem is I call them guys and I say they're figures, and again that that diminishes what we actually see, and what we actually see is. Um, It's confusing, right? It's purposefully confusing. There's a sense of we got the trademark wrinkled neck with the ear, a doubling of ears, a, 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 a closed fist, it seems, an arm attached to whom. Um, we've got um, a kind of completion, um, almost, uh, you know, it's almost in early modern terms, you say monster birth right, the sense of a conjoining of bodies, right, and uh, so this is a, this is an artist that purposely working against the kind of tidying up of the world, right, tidying it up so that we know where we are at, and so that's part of the strategy, right, is that it, there's a sen certain sense of instantaneity, that it's the happenstance, we're in a world of accident, Right, accident where uh, it's an arbitrary relationship between us and things. That's that's part of life too, right? Is that um, is that accidental quality, and that's frightening, right? And in a religious context, that's deeply frightening to have a sense of the term chance is just beginning to be invented of fortune, fate, yes. But chance, right? That that sh shit happens, right? That that things happen, not from this, not from that, not from here, but just it happens. So there's a sense of that happenstance in this object. Now, part of that is again, we're building on things like figurative relationships, composition, or decomposition, right? It's, it's like knowing the rules of composition and undercutting them, right? And it's the undercutting which puts us on edge, right? It's knowing the game, knowing the rules, and then, not that he doesn't know the rules, he, he knows the rules, but it's the undercutting of them that creates the the event of a martyrdom, of, a, of an assault, of a disintegration of a person into the world, of the creation of relics, of objects that exceed the, the body, enter into the world, enter into the world, diffuse and disseminate into the world. And so that's the, that's the material basis that is those pilgrims in 1600, that's what they're looking at. Question. What is the bottom of the writer? Is that a leg rubbing down the knee and then a band cloth around it? Or is that 
this. Can anybody figure it out? <laughs> it's it's got to be the butt, Bob. <laughs> right? This is this is the this is the or that's in other words, the, 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 that's the problem is we're we're entering into that game, right? You don't enter into that game here, but he's there's a definite sense of in lack of certitude and identification of the body parts, right? Right. So, so what's occurring is it's, un, it's unnerving, right? Because it, you, you kind of, you're supposed to be looking at the drama and in the certitude of the narrative, and yet the narrative is about the de, the devolving human body, uh, about a kind of un, un, a, a lack of cer uncertainty, a lack of certainty. Um, it, it's. Uh, the, the Tom Gunn poem I return to, which is, he's looking at the, uh, at the uh, in the Chirazi Chapel, and he says the, the shadow brims into the actual shadow, and the key is the subject is in doubt. The subject is in doubt. So here's the introduction of that kind of doubt, right? That you're not, in other words, there's a certain narrative of saying, oh, he resolves it and it becomes, he wants to become cl clarified. And yet, these, these areas of uncertainty is about that, a certain kind of nagging doubt about our own capacities to know the world. Okay, so how do we know the world? Or how do we know the world in pictures, right? And if you're a, an Italian in 1600, you know the world through a chiaroscuro, right? And it goes, you know, you can look at video graphics today, and it's the same, same old, same old, which is this whole idea of you've got a light source, you've got the, uh, the, the, this, this idea, and I, I usually, my shortcut is to talk about tonal gradation, tonal painting. Uh, it's this tradition from Masaccio which is to emphasize the volumetric figure in a narrative in a plausible space through the shifting of tone. And that as designating um, the raking of light and the, the interference of an object in light, creating internal shadow and importantly, cast shadow. So, so, and in Masaccio, you know, in the Boccaccio Chapel, and the great, great example, the, 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 the who, you know, Vasari and the whole tradition finds its roots back to Giotto, then Masaccio as the inheritor of Giotto, in this lineage. Um, he could subtly use, you know, here he introduces shadow, the shadow of St. Peter, in, in a, having a deeply emotional and religious narrative end. It's not just figures in space, it's the shadow that it's creating the healing. So it's a very already, as early as the mid 15th century, there's this self-consciousness of, in this northern Italian, this Tuscany, Florentine, this, you know, that's, the, that's, that's what's remarkable about this technology, is it's it's fairly isolated. It's in a one little city-state up in northern Italy. And Italy is really a multicultural hodgepodge of cultures and wines and dialects, et cetera, at this time. And what's, what's striking is how pervasive this kind of assumption of the pictorial language takes place. That, that's what we kind of take for granted, is this kind of work. Now, now again, the, the, the assumption of it is that in something like Piero, it, uh, again, part of the bucket list, right? Arezzo, um, the San Francesco uh, church in Arezzo, um, is how do we know that this is a triangle or it's a cone? How do we know that this Constantine lying under this thing 
this, in this spatial configuration, it's a tent and not a geometric diagram. And that's because the world is ordered by Piero according to the gradation of tone across this surface to suggest a light source that's reflecting on this, which creates the sense that there is, there must be a circle there and there must be this member here to suggest a volumetric form. Now, this area is like the key for me because it, again, and I, I warned you last time, I, I hate to hang on to the language, but the, let's just, they're just post, they're just markers for us um, about what I'm trying to explain pictorially and visually and formally um, is a sense that, you know, and this is, Tenebrism is, becomes like the, the kind of dominant, it becomes a, a, a major way of imagining a picture in the first half of the 17th century. It, it goes on a tailspin when it gets trashed by people like Bolori, when he's Bolori, the art historian, first, first biographer of artists that was not an artist. Um, he trashes Caravaggio and uh, see him, sees him as the death of painting. And it's based on, again, this, uh, this kind of, um, this, a certain kind of rhetoric. And, and a rhetoric which is about a domination of the market by a <coughs> pictorialization. So, okay, so this idea that I want to stress here is that the seemingly accidental or random and therefore natural patches of illumination contrast with opaque areas. So again, it, it kind of has that nat, uh, kind of realistic effect, the effect of the real, as it were, because it seems somewhat arbitrary rather than planned or a priori or something coming out of someone's head. It seems to be as it is. But if you push it more, what I, what I see again here, um, if, we don't, if we do the squint test, right, if you squint at this patch, or if you squint at the whole painting, what you see is a, there's a certain breaking point where the gradation of tone, which would suggest a volumetric figure, has collapsed, right? It's too, it's too violent of a juxtaposition of light and dark. It's the push-pull effect. <coughs> And the body itself is experiencing that push-pull, right? So the body, it, you know, never mind trying to figure out what body part belongs to what part, the body itself is <coughs> dismembered, right, or violated. Um, in other words, it, it's the, where the light and the dark, the way we un uh, comprehend the world in pictures is being threatened. So it's a, threaten, it's, th it's a threat to the very fabric of kind of being comfortable in the world of, of pictorial culture of the 15th through 17th century. And this is the, this is a kind of breaking point. Now part of that, when I, you know, again, rehearsing the book, um, what I like to do is I set it up in relationship to um, a set of concerns which are around um, the sociability and so the social context of such a, such a work. And part of the social context in 1600 is the cult of martyrdom, the cult of relics. Um, the, at this mo it's, a very, it's, a, it's a moment where they're very directed toward looking to violent martyrdom as a uh, strategy for conversion um, up until 1600. The 1580s and the, to 1600 saw widespread genocide, uh, inter-religious war, and also um, a series of you know, uh, Catholics moving to England for the purposes of being found out and being killed by Queen Elizabeth. Um, so it's a and, and the moment that they were killed, there, there were people gathering their blood and scurrying it off across the continent to Catholic countries as relics, as 
proof of this. So this is a very heady environment of um, attachment to violent death and the redemption that's possible through the physical presence of the dead. So the, the painting is taking on that charge, that kind of surplus of meaning, uh, that um, which cannot, it, uh, in other words, uh, chiaroscuro is not equipped, I would say, to, to answer that charge at that moment. So questions or uh, thoughts about it? Since we have a painting in front of us, or an image of a painting, yeah. When you showed the picture, the close up with, with the self portrait, yeah. what you didn't remark on is that there seems to be a knee out of nowhere, a giant, go back one, where is it? Yeah. yeah. There's a knee in the lower right. Who, who's that? There's a big giant knee, right? With a shadow on it. It's a funny shadow, and it, it's a big giant knee. It doesn't belong to anybody, right? Well, yeah. Man, that's a giant knee for Carl Rogers. I mean, it's really weird. Well, the, the irony, of course, is at this time you're paid by the figure. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, hey, I, I, there's, a, there's 10 guys there. What? <laughs> um, yeah, it, in other words, it's, it is. It, what you're pointing out again, I want to stress, is that um, the picture is soliciting this kind of distraction, right? And I'm not going to put you down for it being, you shouldn't be looking there, you know? I'm, you sh <laughs> right? I could, I could pull that number, believe me. I, some of my colleagues would. But that, that, that intuitive response of the image, which is about its illegibility or it discomfort, all those feelings that we get from a picture that in which we feel alienated from it, right? That's key. Alienation is, you know, high on my list of why I became an art historian, right? It's not because I, you know, had this heart pat for a, a picture, but I was trying to figure out why is it so damn alienating? How or how, how could I be so distant from that historical culture that just took this in while it has nothing to do with my experience? So that, that sense of alienation from it is really a important, you know, and, you know, it comes out from being a, you know, you know, growing up with uh, post-minimalism, you know? It's the same, same stuff, right? What the fuck? You know, like, you know that sense of um, not having the feeling insecure and not having the equipment but to comprehend the image. But that, that is the material of the picture. Is that right? Yeah. Um, my question is, if you're talking about the sheen and fading topography, yeah. when he um, basically uh, refuted or abandoned those things, and I... I Who's talking? I, I can't see in this light. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, you know, style for me is the S word. You know, I, I have, I have real, I'm just saying, that, that, I'm just in the well, layout, the my car is on the table. Like Michelangelo did things versus the way Raphael did things versus et cetera. So was he? Yeah, he, I mean, I, there's other parts, you know, not part of this narrative today, which is about like the Amar Vincitania which is he has a, since he has a uh, ironic relationship to that past culture. And, and in that rivalry, there's always this stronzo rivalry among these male Italian artists, uh, whether they're dead, if living colleagues, you know, they're into it, but even the dead are not safe from this competition. And so this is happening here, right? Um, 
it's it by refiguring the criterion is a way of of um, it's not dismissing again it's um, it's emulation which is honoring through competition but there's also uh, what's complicated here is this kind of um, ironic citation relation and irony or camp uh, that's why you know like uh, Jarman's Caravaggio is a great film because it captures that sense of this, that irony is the way to sincerity, right? Irony is when, you, when it's all been recycled and where do we go from here, which is 1600, it's all, you know, the, I could show you, uh, you know, the, the blandness of the 1580s. It's like there's a real... Uh, such sense of compromise, and art is ineffectual. And suddenly it's like this uh, relationship to the past, but it, it's not, again, it's this, it's this um, and irony, again, is the hardest thing to establish because it's so unstable as a category. Yeah. Uh, it, um, but, it, but it's also an act of true love, right? Um, so it's kind of, you know, I'm, I, I know I'm kind of working around that, but, but I think so that uh, you're raising up this important question about his relationship to tradition. And I don't buy the kind of, you know, revolutionary kind of flip it on its edge. I'm not, I'm not arguing that there, but because there's a, it, the way to dis reconfigure or dismantle chiaroscuro is to understand it and what the stakes are. In order, in order to understand, and that's, that's like ir irony is when you know it so well, you know your past and your tradition so well that you can riff on it and undercut it, but then sh have sincerity about it. That, yeah, the, again, uh, but, but again, this is, we have, to, we have to keep in mind too, it's like the mandate of this kind of highly public space um, of this, this, this particular church. Um, what did I find? So the, well, I'll go back. So those are teaching points, but again, the you know, so the, the teaching point is kind of gets upstaged by the point, as I said, by Tom Gunn, which is I see how shadow in the painting brims with a real shadow drowning all shapes out, but a dim horse's haunch and various limbs until the very subject is in doubt. In other words, what the hell are you doing looking at the horse, right? And why, you know, why, and you're right in looking at the horse because that's what the painting is demanding, right? And then, so you're confronted with this disorientation about what's the expectation. So that's, that's one major kind of um, experiment, as it were, uh, a monumental experiment by Caravaggio. The other major experiment was this painting. Uh, it's in the Louvre, which tells us something, that it's a portable easel painting, monumental, um, in that hallway, the Grand Gallery, kind of the orphan, another orphan image, along with the fortune teller. Um, and it's a painting that's in, it's a very distressed painting. It's, it's awful to see it in that site. Um, it, it has to do with its, um, you know, it, uh, its confiscations and its movement. And in other words, it's a, it's a conservative's nightmare, and the French don't touch it because it's that. But, but that, that, in a sense, becomes a, a question. Um, again, we are always trying to make inferences about the meaning of a picture from the given condition. And it's always... You're in, you're swimming, swimming in uncertainty. You know, you could look to the lab reports or whatever, but there's a, there's a sense of a nagging doubt about 
what it looked like. But a painting is also, every artist knows that a painting is an unstable living thing, right? And when you, if you, if you produce something, you, you know that it's going to enter into this, into entropy, into chance, into degradation. It, it devolves in a certain way. So, so I've, I've been interested in that idea about that anticipation of decay, um, where you know, artists are purposely, you know, um, Rome used to be, before it became sanitized in the 19th century with that wonderful ochre, reddish mandate everywhere. Um, before that, there were frescoes on buildings all over the place. A guy named Caravaggio di Pomodoro was the top, most important painter in late 16th century Rome. Everyone knew him because he was out there on his scaffold with his crew painting outside windows. Now, that's kind of like, you know, the fresco at Oliveira Street. You know, it's like the, it's about anticipation of decay. You know, you put something out in the, fresco in the out, out in the open air, it's gonna, it's gonna go, right? So again, um, that uh, a sense of a painting, and in this painting about death, trying to, trying to push the metaphor here. Uh, the metaphor of decay, death, that problem, and about the material processes and the way that the material processes of the painting inform the overall this, the meanings of the painting. Now, this is a painting that is chock full of problems because it was identified early on in the literature as the source of lots of diatribes. Like, I mean, uh, the, um, and part of that was the knowledge that the painting had been removed from its, from its altarpiece. And it's an altarpiece. It's not a lateral painting. It's an altarpiece. And it's an altarpiece dedicated to the Virgin Mary. And it was removed after it had been inserted in the altarpiece. So there was also some speculation about that. And the, the narratives that emerge in the mid-17th century are, you know, um, misogynist body shame diatribes. That is to say, she's bloated, she bloated, you know, not the, not the picture, but she is bloated, she was a, a, a um, Meretrice, uh, streetwalker, not a courtesan, but a streetwalker uh, who drowned in the river. Uh, you know, all these amplified, uh, his, you know, male hysterical language ascribing to the painting. And so, to, you know, it fits the kind of, you know, around Liberty Storming the Barricade by Adelaqua or Manet's Olympia is like when the stuff hits the fan, when you get this kind of, this language, this concentration of language attacking a woman in a painting, then you know that something is, on, something is interfering with the, the absorption of that image into the pictorial culture and the religious culture. Um, you know, again, we can have the arguments, is she bloated, is she not? And I've gotten all sorts of arguments about that. And I, I, wanna, I don't want to go there, really, uh, whether she is or not, because that's not the point. The point is that what we're looking at is an incredible, I, I see it as an you know, extremely profound image um, that is out of step. And part of it's out of step, and we can talk about it that historically. But it's also out of step because the, the, the world is changing more rapidly than the picture is. And that's the constant pressure about looking at 
art within a so-called social art history or historical studies is that most art takes longer time from beginning to end, but it's also, it's often out of step with rapid change. Uh, you know, like, that's why everybody loves to, myself included, you know, looking to French, the French Revolution. You know, David is caught there with his pants down because the, the change of the culture is so rapid that his painting can't catch up to it, right? He's there, you know, he's working on that third nude figure, and guess what? That guy's just got, lost his head, right? So it's that, it's that discoordination. That's what's most important. It's not the reflection of art in relationship to society, but it's the discoordination that's of interest here. And that discoordination is, you know, it's kind of, it's explanatory in terms of certain ways of thinking about what we've already looked at, if you recall, this is the altar, again, altar piece, in the Chirazi Chapel, the one that Tom Gunn doesn't talk about, which is Anibale Karachi's Assumption of the Virgin. And that Assumption of the Virgin is, is where the understanding of the Virgin Mary as beyond sin and beyond death, beyond corruption, beyond, beyond, right? Um, and Part of that is it's insinuated into, and I'll use the word style, is the, um, the, 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 the ways that it recalls Raphael, the ways that it's situated within a orthodox tradition. Um, and it, but it, again, putting these two together, um, what is, What's problem about this narrative is the, the sequence of the narrative. Mary's alive. Mary lies down, is on her deathbed. The, the apostles miraculously, they fly from around the globe because they're out they <laughs> doing literally. Some, you know, the, the, what he avoids is the window with the St. Peter coming in, um, which is in print. Uh, but there's a sense of this is a, you know, this is a, a very intimate reunion of, you know, past friends, past disciples. This is the end of her life. The son has been dead for several years. And this is, this is that, the anguish of them communing together. Okay, so it's that, it's that moment where, again, it's, I always stress to my students that it, you know, they, despite the disempowerment and disenfranchisement of women symbolically within societies, economically, politically, et cetera, across the board, there is this intense symbolic importance tantamount to the representation of women. So in the, the assumption of the virgin, of course, the stakes of virginity and cleanliness and um, the absol uh, being absolved of sin is the problem. But there's also, importantly, in this tradition, this is one of the dominant ways of imagining the, the sequence. And this is uh, in the church of Santa Maria, uh, um, the, uh, Santa Maria in Trastevere, um, this is a church that's within walking distance of the Santa Maria della Scala, which is where uh, the painting by Caravaggio used to hang. Um, so this painting, um, the, uh, rather this mosaic by Cavallini, a contemporary of Giotto, um, was known, and it represents this Byzantine tradition where we have the major components, which is um, the virgin on a bed, the, her son with the, her, the soul of the virgin being carried off to heaven. And the, the term is a transitus. In other words, it's the transition to, between, the, between being a living person to this other state. Sometimes it's called the, the translation or, it, so it's not quite the assumption. 
It's this liminal state, the in-between state that's being expressed here. So similarly, that's precisely where Caravaggio is going, is that liminal state. But that liminal state seems has the problem of being arrested. There's no, you know, we'll go back to this. You know, where are one more just by itself? Ta -da. You know, in anticipation of her heavenly movement, we look up here and we have this beautiful attention to a fabric, but there's no angels. There's no Jesus with the soul. Um, we are at that moment where Mary Magdalene um, is, contains all of her grief within herself. It's like the, um, you know, it's like the, it's, the, it's the problem with Saul, right? Saul, not Paul. Saul is going to be blind for three days, and he can, he can have grasped doubt about whether or not he will be saved or be, you know. So this is, and similarly for the, um, this is like the Supper of Emmaus where the apostles are dumbfounded because they've lost their friend and they have no, there's no sign yet of the resurrection. There's no sign of an afterlife. It's, it's suddenly it's just cut off. And so it's the doubt or the areas of the tension, unresolved tension in the system of belief, which becomes a powerful component of this. And we know this, I mean, we can, we can figure it out, again, by they take it down and they put a replacement. And then they say, oops, Saracini, not good enough. Let's put in another, and this is what's in the, in the, in the church right now. Plenty of, plenty of stuff up here, you know, and she's, she's pert, right? She's sitting up, she's ready to go, you know, she's, uh, so anyway, uh, and this is a popular, this became a, there's a, a collector who has a couple versions of this. Uh, painting and was on the loan to the Met, and it's it's an incredible, it's a beautiful, you know, it's a great painting, and Serracini is a knockout, but but again, he's you know he's wrestling with his bosses, right? And so so the bosses, um, and this is part of the argument, is like, okay, what is the context for this demand for uh, the resolution? Now, part of it is now. You know, we can say, oh, bad boy, bad boy, bad boy, this painting, you know, is a failure. But it's not a failure. It's taken down because the, 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 the people who moved in to the real estate of Santa Maria della Scala didn't want the picture. And guess what? Get, the part of the narrative is great. It's like um, Peter Paul Rubens is in town. He's hanging out, he's been hanging out in Mantua, he comes down to do some drawings and get a portfolio of drawings of the, of Paul, the Paulo Belvedere, et cetera. And then he's acting as a, an in-between, a dealer with the Duke and says, hey, I can get you this. So he outbids, uh, he outbids a flock of people, they, they take it down for the church, they put it into a public space because people are pissed off that it's an elite town without having seen it. And so they put it up and then it goes up north because of, uh, that's where the money goes. So it's an amazing, you know, the reason it's in the Louvre now is again because of this interesting phenomenon of a consecrated, worshipful altarpiece suddenly becoming a collectible, right? A museum piece, eventually. So the sac secularization of a sacred object. But it was happening because of a certain pressures and demands 
on it, the demand of desiring these objects. So there's desire and there's repudiation. The repudiation comes around because of a shift from the days of already the days of martyrdom are over, or martyrdom is being reconfigured. Uh, 1600, uh, just a year after the discovery of the intact, uncorrupted body of Santa Cecilia in a ninth century church, in Trastevere. So down the hill from Santa Maria um, della Scala, just down from the Trastevere, in Trastevere is the church of Santa Cecilia. And it was a, it was a uh, festival of incredible people coming to see this body from a ninth century, um, not ninth century, like fourth century Christian martyr whose body was ostensibly intact. So the, the test of martyrdom, or the test of sanctity, the test of sainthood, Suddenly, even for a martyr, she was, they tried to kill her by steaming her to death, and they ended up trying to chop her head off. That, those narratives persisted, right? But around this cult of Santa Cecilia, and this is Santa Cecilia and the Norton Simon, a, a, a painting, a contemporaneous painting by Remy, um, where we have this cult around a, a, the, the, the patron saint of music, but also a cult around a female that is the test of sanctity, the test of her, um, being, her capacity to be a saint, is not by so much her dismemberment, but by her intact purity. Um, so the stakes, you know, the stakes of, again, this this resurgence in the extraction of uh, bodies and the uh, confiscation of relics in the, and this is a drawing of the, uh, and again, uh, the Vatican, of um, the recording of the, the belief system in which incorruptibility is tantamount to holiness. And this is a, this is a, Again, I'm um, saying that the shift already is, um, in some sense, in this general sense, uh, Caravaggio's work is already anachronistic. And that's why, anachronistic in the church setting. Um, around this, the cult of relics, the cult of Cecilia, and this, uh, this is an amazing, I, I love this image. Um, this is a broom closet next to a chapel in the, in the Plato Alcamp, just off of the Piazza Navona. And in the broom closet, you kind of screw on the light, open it up, and you see a, um, a devotion to the catacomb. Um, a, so in, within, this, within this, again, this, this religious uh, fervor at the moment, there's this attachment to the sense of bodies remaining intact, um, fooling death, right? Fooling decay. Um, and that's Moderno's, Moderno's sculpture on the altar surmounting the, the, the uh, remains of Santa Cecilia is precisely that the use of Carrara marble to insist upon uh, the the preservation of the body. So that's, again, the, the criterion of sanctity there is uh, one in which this is enlistment of the purity, preservation, and in this case, the female body, again, highly symbolic. Um, and this is very important because, as I suggested, that the, 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 kind, the people that had moved in to that space in this, around 1600 were the uh, Discalced Carmelites, the followers of Santa Teresa of Avila, a Spanish order, reformed Spanish order, and they were coming into Rome and they wanted Santa Teresa to become a saint, and it worked. By 1621, she achieves, uh, she was canonized as a saint. 
Um, but like the other saints in 1621, none of them are martyrs. They're all doctors of the church or reformers of the church. And there was this uh, disavowal of this kind of, the, the, the church, the, especially the Jesuits, were scared of their own uh, followers in terms of the extremes to which the uh, self-abnegation was taking place. So there's a disavowal of that for an other models of sanctity. And the Carmelites were certainly there. But again, what, what is driving or what I wanted to get to the, not rather the, this kind of obsession with the negative, um, but rather the, um, what, a, a, a kind of different direction in the work of Caravaggio at this time. Um, 1607 work um, in the Capo de Monte. This is a work that um, was immediately executed after uh, Caravaggio fled Rome. Um, the dismantling of the death of the Virgin, that all took place when he was out of the, uh, out of, uh, I was gonna say out of the country, but certainly out of Rome. And uh, in his first foray was in Naples. Um, after the famous or infamous uh, tennis court dispute, which ended up in a homicide, which led him to flee. And then he attempted to get patronage, patrons to get him exonerated to return to Rome. That was his strategy. He never got there. He dies in 1610. But 1607, in this remarkable painting, it's, just, it's, at, the, they, it's at the end of a corridor uh, in the Capo de Monte, the, uh, really underexplored museum in Naples on top of a hill, as it being says. Um, what, what strikes me about it is a certain kind of uh, response to, again, the, um, the devotion, a certain kind of devotion that is driven by an attention to materials, to materiality. Again, keeping in mind Anibale Karachi's kind of disavowal of the materiality of paint, um, Caravaggio at this moment is continuing to sustain a deep understanding of the relationship between sacred bodies and material objects or the, the kind of um, confusion between the human and the non-human. Um, that 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 area of experience, and part of that part of that is um, in this particular work, um, which is so much about again processes and uh, the the body of Christ being uh, defined through the manipulation, the the winding of of rope, the uh, cinching up of that rope. Um, in other words, the body, as much as it's being defined in terms of light and shade, is also being defined as an object that is impressed upon by other objects. Um, and that impression, that sense of contact and the dissolution of boundaries between things and, and, and persons is kind of manifest in something like this, which is to today, this kind of stone is called a flagellation marble. Um, then it's a close up of a, of a uh, the purported column that Christ was bound to. And it's in uh, San Presede, another important ninth century church in Rome. And in this, again, the part of the devotion to this, and it's a very, it's a, it's a, I'm not gonna say silly, but it's a very small object like this, and it, it's it's contained by glass nowadays. But in the in the detail, what we get is a sense that the there was a belief that the the actual um, flagellation of the body of Christ was traced into the stone itself. It was part of the part of the this way that the stone or the object is activated by the violence is perceivable and is embedded in the material world. 
And it's the same kind of belief system again. Um, this is the tomb of uh, Lorenzo de' Medici, who was violently murdered in the uh, cathedral. Um, and as the story goes, uh, the, uh, in his tomb, the, uh, the, the blood uh, stained the marble. And so when Michelangelo, Michelangelo's tomb is actually this intense talismatic object because it, it's imbued with the act of violence against the Medici. So again, that's, that's telling a story, that's telling narrative, but the narrative terms are not bodily oriented. They're oriented toward the materials themselves. It's, the, it's this idea of impetus, of object desires are manifest in the world. Uh, materials matter itself. So painting, we have to remember, is, what, is, is matter, is elemental, is part of the stuff of the world that follows its own desire according to this kind of belief system, which overlaps with the notion of presentia. Again, I reiterate that, which is a sense of the, this contact between the sacred and profane is an active relationship. And so, again, if, we, if you go back to, um, we're going back to Rome now, um, but it's a, this is a painting in the, in the Vatican uh, it was formerly in the Chiesa Nuova, a church that was, that's where Rubens hung out there. And this is a very important painting for him. Um, he made copies of it, et cetera. And he was interested in, in this entombment, in this composition. Uh, for him, again, squint test, no ground, centralized figures, um, a kind of oval shape. Now, that's, that's the kind of action that Rubens sought in this particular painting. So again, paintings can, uh, artists are great critics, but they also are directed towards certain criterion. Uh, the other, another criterion we, we could go to is in the, in the presence of the object, the painting surface, it's a, an extremely a complex surface. And again, it's a, it's a surface that, um, you know, the, there's, this, uh, there's a kind of traditions of layering and putting, uh, you know, starting off with a dark brown and, and uh, introducing a kind of blues, you know, like look at David's uh, flesh tones. And they're incredible, the sense of the blue veins underneath the epidermis is present through a layering of paint. And oil painting is magical that way, right? Because it's, it's, it's translucent, it, uh, it's optically, trans I mean, it, light is going into the surfaces and bouncing back at different intervals. Very complex, unstable material, right? And that, that sense of instability here, it, suddenly that what, what occurs is a sense of what, in this profound moment, again, the profound moment of a mother witnessing the death of her son is the, um, is a sense of the dead likeness of the grays and the, uh, the, the, the ways that the, the surface is, again, I'm, I'm, I have to, this is like uh, trying, to, trying to describe architecture when you're not there, right? This is the architecture of the surface of a painting. And, it, it, and it, 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 it's not fixed, it's, it's, it's process oriented. And there's a sense of it's the layering, the layering that does not reveal life underneath that skin. It's, it's, it, and, then, and then moments like this where the, the intimacy of that wound, the stigmatum, in relationship to the hand is this charged moment of intimacy. And again, this, this probably gives you more of a sense of the, uh, there's a sense of, again, the, the, the dry brush application uh, creates this kind of uh, distressed surface and presence. 
And it's not unlike this. You know, in terms of this is, these two paintings are investigating uh, the materiality of paint as much as the materiality of the mystery of life and death. Um, and it's, as I say, in this painting, there's a sense of the anticipation of the painting's own decay, um, its own entrance into accidental world. Now, I want to just end with another bucket painting, um, bucket list painting, um, which, again, it's, you know, I, I have that freedom of pulling out images uh, to relate to this work, and it's not reference, it's not influence, it's not, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an affinity here, and that's with this work, um, the painting to die for. You know, like, um, basement of the, um, the Prado. And part of it is, again, it's the, um, you know, it's, it's some other, pre, um, it's the son preceding the mother. And it's a work that, again, it, it's, the, it's the great example of how restrictive the tradition of Giotto to Masaccio to Piero is. What's cast aside, right? 1435 contemporaneous with um, with, with uh, Masaccio on to Piero. Um, and it's a work that is, is about the, um, it's structured around an understanding that an altarpiece is a wood sculpted altarpiece. That the figures within the wood sculpted altarpiece are fixed and a and confined by the borders of that frame. And so it, it's conceptually about a vivified uh, tableau, a sculptural tableau, right? That's part, of this, that's part of the wonder of this work. And so what that means is that in order to, that human expression is not confined to animation and movement and violence. Extension, right? Extension into a perspectival space. It's about the crampness of grief, of being confined by, of Mary here, like Mary in our uh, Death of the Virgin. Mary's constraint within this space is highly affective. And again, you know, there's wonderful plays between this animate an inanimate status of these objects turned sculpture turned living things. In other words, the whole vocabulary is about that uh, permeability of an inanimate world and animate human figures. But the kicker, again, is for this work is in order to explain this, this anguish is the what we have here is a kind of formal pun, right? Of Christ and the mother. Her pain is so intense that she becomes her son. She becomes death-like. She becomes, she, she mimics him. So that's a, you know, that's not uh, an Italian uh, conception of human internal feeling outwardly expressed. It's about the body's conformity to the status of an object in the world and our visual capacities to link these two objects. Um, and it's also that, that sense of, you know, this is a passage that contains, again, that kind of sensitivity to the narrative, right? We've, we've, but narrative as ex expressed through inanimate objects. So the, if we're talking about 
we're talking about the, the intensity of feeling we have in front of this picture or this picture and certainly this picture. It's about tree being, coming to some kind of understanding of our own sense of disillusion into a material world. And again, the, the way that, that it's sustained here, and this, is, this ties us back finally to, to Caravaggio, is the way that the most intimate detail of a still life, this interpretation of this, this vellum and, I mean, rather, um, this uh, velvet and inlaid cloth. Um, but importantly here, this is the moment where we see that the, the blood that had been cascading down is now understood to be um, descendant. In other words, it contains that moment in its higher narrative. And now it's moved into this other moment where the attachment between mother and son, their co-affinity, um, is, is felt on this intimate level. So I have to leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions if you have the time. Feel free. Got a hand way back. Right. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, I know the, the lapis lazuli, the, the blue is the, the traditional ways of seeing it. I think it's, um, I mean, there seems to be a preoccupation of relationship between the, her cloth and the cloth above. Um, and that's part of the mystery is, do you read that cloth to be animate and sacred, or is it just you know, part of the, the ceiling picture? Um, so part of the answer is it, it doesn't fit with the kind of symbolic code, the conformity of the symbolic code. And so maybe it's the displacement of that code that allows for a certain kind of um, uh, play on um, that, the status of her mortality. Um, is it that, does that help or is that, you don't know. Yeah, I don't go there. Um, I don't go to the, to the red prostitute yeah. angle. But it, in other words, it, it's, um, the bio, again, the biography, which I've shied around. You know, again, I could go on. I'd publish on that separately from the book. But um, the sense of the, 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 the biography hijacks our understanding of the work, right? So the biography, or it's not even the biography. It's the, the naysayers. Like Balioni is a major biographer. He, they hated each other. They, he went to, he, the guy, imagine the guy who sues you for libel ends up writing your biography. <laughs> so, what do you, uh, so what do you, you know, what, what do you do about that evidence? And then the guy, the next guy in line is, just loves French painting and is writing to King Louis XIII. And he doesn't, he's never picked up a brush in his life. He's an antiquarian. So these are the guys that are kind of uh, uh, hijacked. And I'm, I'm saying that, you know, we're like, it's a thing of, bio we're, it's this problem is you want to, I mean, I construct biographies, but the biography for me is what people are doing on the ground in the studio, right? Um, and there's this, you know, we all know that there's discrepancies between our lived experience and what we do in other areas. That's a good thing. Um, and that they're bad people that are great artists. We know that. 
and we get that gets into really da not dangerous, but that's where the heated arguments, you know, the Chuck Close incident, right? What do you do with Chuck? You know, but he's a living artist, and the abuse, the trace of abuse is still there. So, but um, you know, it, uh, you know, Susan, uh, the you know Son Susan Sontag on on Nazi propaganda. You know, I still, I that that's you know, I have my limits. So. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a question of, uh, again, um, you're opening up this, the, the thing that's kind of under the, that's informing the work is what, what kinds of biographical evidence can we bring to bear that can be meaningful? And where does the, where is an artist out of step with, I mean, their uh, artists are always out of step of their publics. They imagine a public and they're out of step with it at the same time. And they, well, but, the best thing they can do is produce it, right? So I have a thought yeah. about the West, and, and you know, I'm probably just making this up. I, I am making this up. Please do. Um, but uh, it's the warmth of the palette and the optical illusion uh, that is created. Uh, if you look at the spatial contradiction in the overall composition, you're both looking down figure and the visibility of the feet, and you look at the, the extreme distance, then there's this push and pull, and she's levitating, and because of the vividness of the palette, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. sense of exaggerated levitation of her figure versus the downcast weight and gravity of everyone around her expresses the assumption. Mm -hmm. And it's also the blood, the blood of the body that is drained from the corpse which somehow is acting as a metaphor uh, to follow your, your thinking of how the immaterial translates into the divine in its weight and yeah. then its levitation. Mm. Well, when I, spare, when I see the same Matthew, I was surprised by the angel of God when as contorted as a figure of below. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. to me, like the caravan just think that the, what's up there is as bad as what is up <laughs> <Right. laughs> And here it seems like there is nothing. It's surprising that, yeah. the, like, I'm not surprised that they're shooting off the church because she's wearing a red dress and there's nobody in the sky. Right, right. I mean, so. I mean when you were saying that you were. I was thinking of Lear and Ophelia, you know, like seeing the, the feather move and being caught in that moment of wanting him to die, thinking that the feather is moving when it's not, or we know it not to be. So it's like that, it, you're, you're caught in the contradiction of, is it levitation or not? Or is it, is there salvation or not? Mm -hmm. um, and that's the thing, is, you know, this kind of this in this particular religious culture, you have to up the ante in terms. Of, you have to make sus it's, there has to be suspense about uh, the miracle, or your suspense about the belief. You have to. Have the, there's a sense of you having to have the doubt. The doubt is built into the system, so that if you achieve that other state, it's meaningful as opposed to just yeah. It's so what you know. You know what the so, um, but the the fact about the that that an, the angel the angel that comes down, again it's that yeah it's the way that the um, uh, disarticulated body, you know it's disarticulated and it's it's vivid but it's also it's 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 worrisome the way that it 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 will not conge it will not become coate. Yeah. 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 Jericho is like when he was in Rome. This is where he he went. You know, or not not here. He went. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs>